important uh, announcement from Mr. Mugulabu. Mr. Mugulabu. Thank you so much. I appreciate everybody has spoken. Uh, the next thing you are coming ordinarily is um, interventions from the floor, and then our leader, Mr. Akado, because of time, just I need to say it. Um, if you look at your program, there's a part B. But after taking consultations with two of our leaders here, uh, Mr. Luda Rakande, and then President elect, the council is actually, it's not good to just go and drop a letter from the government, who, of course, will not be expecting us. And that is better, since we are not gone, because when you go and protest, you don't need invitation, you don't need protest. You go there, you stand the barricades, and you drop your letter for them. But since today, we are not in the trenches. In fact, they've come from Alausa before the beginning of this. Now, what is happening? <laughs> <laughs> now, what this is the truth? They called me and they said, ah, hey, and they called me that my pet name, Sherry Bauer. What is happening? I said, there's nothing. There's nothing. So, when our president elect uh, council, and our uh, leader, Mr. Lara, the council just said, well, there's no need. I'm not saying I forgot to say about Mr. Bata, and I need to say it because you need to me. I'm not apologizing for laughing to you all the time. Because I've told people before, if you are not a Christian, if you are not a Muslim, but you are a Yoruba person or an African person, and you know the proverbs and the philosophy of your people, you make a vote. <laughs> you make a vote. The proverbs are scriptural. They are scriptural. Uh, you're about to say, I shall go. I will do you. Let the hawk look at it. Let the eagle look at it. Look at it. Whatever you do together in common, you will likely get the very best result. But you both will say, two heads are better than one. Can you really compare to that to a shower? How would you go? We are talking of acute of vision. The orc itself is very acute, not to talk of the ego. There's a necessity of putting heads together. And so I want to announce to everybody, after taking due consultation advice from our leaders, it's better that we set that aspect down. And Mr. Akpata had said, he even told me three days ago, I will follow you. We will be there to deliver the letter. So when he was saying something about it, you be an activist. I said, well, it's possible. It's possible. It's, it's possible. Our perspectives will differ. It's important to make this announcement. We are not going to take too long again and for us to know the reason so that we will not say that not the compromise. Mm -hmm. uh, while I was waiting for this program to start, I let me quickly have this. I was at the bar center. Uh, one lady came to me. And then she said that, ah, so you are Mr. Mulano. We used to know you as a fiery publisher of that fiery publication, the screen. But people said that immediately you came to Chiama of MB Ikeja, you compromised with the authorities of MB Ikeja. I said, what is that? It is the party party. It is the job. And that's the reputation. I told the fellow, the lady, that they accept the dog is mad. It's not only a mad dog that backs all the time. When you are not a mad dog, you back selecting you. And that's what happened. We didn't compromise anything. So this is important that I am the one who is making this, in, this uh, information. I will have uh, made the, uh, our secretary, but to know that uh, it's coming from the highest echelon of the combined forces of the uh, Progressive Bar Forum. And I did, when I was had my first bar, I didn't say this. Progressive Bar Forum is our foundation. And anybody that knows the history of the NBA in Kedja from 2004, our first leader, Dr. Ojo, to 2018, that's 14 years, except for the internet, quote unquote, of our other gentleman, Mr. Monday Urbano, 2012 to 2014, the progressive PBF leadership was one piloting the Kedja. And apart from the official executive, the think tank that Mr. Richard Akinola was saying, the think tank was the Progressive Bar Forum. And they were there for us. It's a pity that Mr. Dave Ajitomaki was not there. I called him, he declined to come for reasons. And he said, I said, you had not have moved the motion. 
on the floor of the house. You raise our eyes to it. That what's happening? The land is charged. The progressive bar forum that has been demonized now in the MP in Kenya has been the think tank. They have been the think tank, the courage. And when people are saying, I met them. They say, why are you so loyal to them? I met them. I met them. We could have become popular and other kinds of speech, but I met these people. We, we met them, we must respect their sacrifices. All those years of progressivism, these people got it by the, by the blood in 1996-98. And it's the truth, but we won't go to that today. So gentlemen, we are not delivering the letter today, not because we are compromised, you know, which is because better counsel dictates otherwise, I think. So to speak. But it does imply that they have a profound impact on development outcomes of that society or group. The power elite of Nigeria today encompasses those in positions of authority, not necessarily in government, that can influence the programs and activities of major political, legal, educational, business, culture, traditional, religious, security, communication, and media, and civil institutions in our country. The fact is, though there is no real or actual cabal holding meetings at all hours to determine the fate of a nation, the nested groups of power elites that dominate the certain specific spheres aforementioned exact measurable impact on policy development and outcomes in Nigeria. As a group then, these individuals by virtue of their position or influence they possess have unprecedented authority to make decisions that have, that have national and even international consequences for our nation. Even though these individuals constitute a close-knit group, they are not part of a conspiracy that secretly manipulates the event in their own selfish interests. For the most part, the elite operates openly and is not a dictatorship. It does not rely on terror or secret police or midnight arrest to get its way. Nor is its membership close, although many members have enjoyed a head start in life by virtue of their being born to prominent families. Nonetheless, those who work hard, enjoy good luck, and demonstrate a willingness to adapt, adopt elite values do find it possible to walk into higher circles from below. If the middle class or, or elite does not derive its power from repression or inheritance, where does its, its strength come? Basically, it comes from control of the highest position of the political and business hierarchy and for shared values and beliefs. Finally, on this on this note, I want to put it to you, the organizers. You know when I say when I, say, I want to put it to you, I remember. I, I remember the uh, the wife of uh, Dr. Uh, he, he's a strange wife. I mean, former teachers of Nigeria, and they were fighting over the custody of their child. Or uh, not a young man, a grown up uh, So the woman was not. I mean. She was not somebody who was, uh, I was surprised that the wife of the chief of of Nigeria was not conversant with all the etiquettes in court and stuff like that. So she was a witness box. And uh, I think it was Ladna, SN, who was examining her. First of all, I know when you start, um, when you was like, okay, where do you live? I have a question, where do you live? They say, why are you asking about my address? What do I have to do? You see, you're just tired. You're just tired to come and ask me an address, so I come and visit So, then, I look at the line. Then, the, the counsel said, I put, I put it to you, the organizers and participants of this event that you belong to the enlightened middle class and part elite of Nigeria. Policy development. Policy development process refers to a series of steps taken by a government to solve problems, make decisions, allocate resources or values, implement policies, and in general, do the things expected of them by their constituencies. When talking about policy development in Nigeria, we mean decision-making process in the country. We mean decisions taken by a government that are intended to solve problems and improve the quality of life of citizens. Normally. Policy development goes through several stages. These are agenda building, formulation, adoption, implementation, evaluation, and termination. In a democratic environment like we are now run, the role played by the power elites in agenda setting 
makes policy, public policy change inevitable. These have been heavily demonstrated by the Oguna and leadership of the Tiger Bar. On that premise, public policy can be seen as a set of interrelated constitutions by a political actor or group of actors consigned the selection of goals and the means of achieving them within a specified situation where those decisions should be should in principle be within the power of those actors to achieve. Our major concern here is the action taken by government policy directions as it affects the health, education, poverty reduction, security, etc. Public policy, therefore, can be a decision taken by government in the areas that affect social economic and social development. Public policy thus far. The dominant feature of policy making process in Nigeria is the principle of federal supremacy, which is a conditional, uh, conditionality in Nigeria. Under the Constitution, the federal government is expected to provide the overall uh, direction and leadership in the planning process for the formulation stage through the implementation and evaluation stages. The decision making under the federal supremacy principles requires the National Economic Council, which is presided by, over by the Vice President, to advise the President concerning the economic affairs of the Federation and in particular on major industry for the coordination of economic planning efforts or the economic development programs of various states in Nigeria. The institutions that are involved at the early stage include the ministries of finance and etc. The host of problem associated with policy development in Nigeria. I'm, I'm trying to quote Olani, uh, but I will just say, uh, but I mean the paper, I mean I have some topics which I will, I will go to this so I, let me jump uh, that aspect. The, the power elite and power development. In Nigeria, like in almost every society, the power elites consisting of members of the economic elite and policy planning networks hold the levers of power. These four guys at the top hold positions and compares the polls the post with the authority to run programs and, and activities of major political, economic, legal, and um, security institutions. The occupants of these offices control the nation's industrial, communication, transportation, and almost all the assets through positions, incorporations, or corporate boards, and influence over policy uh, planning networks through financial support of foundations or positions with think tanks or policy decisions. Group members of the power elite exert significant power over corporate and government policy development. How the power elite has deployed its influence over the issue of policy development in Nigeria least much to be desired. This is because the purpose of society is basically to serve individuals or group within the society. This is because the purpose of society is basically to serve individuals or group within the society needs for survival. It is a way of harnessing the resources and abilities of others in order to increase individual chances of survival and improve individual quality of life. When there are when there is a failure of optimal utilization of resources for the good, for the for public good, so that there are no redevelopment changes in relation to objectives, then that there is a cause for concern. The end point of policy development is to solve problems and make life better for all. It does seem that the power elites in Nigeria seek to maximize power rather than pursue altruistic public good and honor. Conflicting interests among the power elites when they differ sharply in ideological settings self-serving interest and manipulation of the instrument of policy making to the advantage creates problem, thus creating a gap or missing link in the structure of public policy formulation and implementation in Nigeria. Nigeria, in my considered opinion, has a parasitic power elite. The jury is out. What's with our nation's position in all development in the indicators? In the areas of health, agriculture, education, poverty reduction, security, etc., our country is far behind. Our people are suffering, and the current precarious political and social economic situation of the country attests to this fact. In fact, it does look now that life on our streets looks like the predicted, as was predicted in Jonathan Swift, Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's travel, that vast numbers of our people are compared to seek their livelihood by begging, robbing, stealing, and cheating. All this tragically, in the midst of plenty, Nigeria is now said to be the poverty capital of the world. This is quite sad to say. 
how do we explain the various policies of assault and campaign promises that remain unfulfilled? Or the economic recession that has almost led to depression? Or the alarming rate of youth unemployment and its attendant social problems? As well as the uncertainty that characterizes the political space many years after uninterrupted democratic governance in Nigeria. There is insecurity everywhere. We are daily faced with tales of kidnapping, armed robbery, banditry, terrorism, electoral heat, and grand corruption. It is the power elites in any society that can make this difference. The industrialization in countries like Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan has had, was the product of their power elites driven enterprise web, whereby small groups of technocrats and business leaders navigated the state towards high rates of economic growth and overall national development. All hands on deck approach. Prior to June 12, 1993, political imbroglio. The enlightened middle class stroke power elite in the, in the private sector had viewed political agitations by the human rights and pro-democracy movements with no chance. Political agitations were left to the human rights community. But the spiral economic consequences of June 12, whereby the whole national economy was brought into its knee, negatively impacting both the middle and upper class and the whole community alike, it became imperative that they joined the struggle and that day back to the formation of concerned professionals, which became a somewhat formidable force in the struggle. It became obvious to them that they were equally victims of the system, and still and loaf would have amounted to self immolation because no sector was immune from the consequences engendered by the political instability of the June 12 crisis. It is self evident that due to the quantum of political and social economic challenges facing Nigeria, uh, public policy, uh, facing Nigeria, Policy development cannot be left out to a few activists alone. The enlightened middle class had to exit their cocoon and be part of effective changes in unfavorable government policies. As members of the power elite, we should no longer bury our heads in the sand in view of the overwhelming odds and challenges uh, that face our, our nation. We must all get on our feet to get involved. All hands must be on deck. A clear demonstration of this effectiveness, uh, of the effectiveness of this approach, of which I commend the Kenya branch of the Nigerian Power Association, a powerful member of the Nigerian Power Edit, was not too long ago. They did not bury their head in the sand when the policy many saw as against the overall interest of legal society was enacted. Former Lagos Governor Akil Miyambodi had assented to a new line of child law that increased child and astronomically. But the Kenya branch of the Nigerian Association, under the leadership of uh, Adesha Ogulano, rose against it in protest and submitted a letter to the titled Call for a Rethink and Review of the Land Use uh, Child Tax. All other excessive taxes, levies, and charges in Lagos, unquote, and gave the state government several days to revise the law. Or face mass protests. From there, several groups, including the Manufacturing Association of Nigeria, had also kicked against the new land use chart. They also made an appearance at the State House of Assembly in efforts to get the policy, re uh, policy reversed. Today, as a fallout, the current Lagos State Government, Babadilish Sawulu, has repealed the Ambodi's uh, 2018 uh, land use law and revised to pre 2018 land use chart. I want to commend Governor Sawulu for this gesture. Formation of think tanks. There is a need for the formation of think tanks to provide policy directions, not only for our nation, but in our state. Eggheads and original thinkers in the country should get involved in scrutinizing the quality of policies being formulated and ensuring their implementation within a realistic time frame. Blaming the government and crime won't solve the problems. The time has come for in-depth research into some of the problems and providing practicable solutions to identify the naughty issues militating against sustainable development and economic growth in Nigeria. Developed nations thrive on the knowledge of their scholars who serve as think tanks to the government and public institutions to deliver on, on set objectives. Think tanks that assist government efforts all over the globe to formulate good policies that can possibly impact democratic government. For instance, there are over 1,000 such think tanks in the US with its presidency empowered with over 120 groups that provide intellectual support for policy formulation and execution. In fact, the United States is 
suffused with sufficient think tanks and policy institutes to justify its rating as one of the full democracies in the world. The Brookings Institution is not only one of the famous and oldest, but certainly one of the best in the world. It sets the policy pace for the United States in terms of governance, public policy, global economy, foreign policy and development. The current precarious uh, uh, political and social economic situation in our country attests to the fact that the giant is short supply of think tank groups that should help the government and public institutions with in-depth research and critical analysis of various policies which have remained incapable of transforming citizens' lives for the better. Enlightenment of government space. Traditionally, government used to be the sole agent of governance. It, it determined the policy and its implementation dynamics. Policies government make have been enclosed within the tight political cocoon that is subject to corruption and to a political economy that is rooted in structural and political injustice and political power play that together stifle development and innovation. The modern administrative revolution, however, demands the enlightenment of the government space in a way that makes the government only a regulator of both the state and non-state actors concerned with policy articulation, promulgation, and implementation. One of these non-state actors are the policy networks, policy institutes, and uh, etc. Now, talking about power and realization um, of what elected self-interest means. To... The power elites in Nigeria need to quickly come to a realization of what elected self-interest means to continue to be a rather plastic group which uh, gets so much for the society and yet does not do what is required to turn the forces of Nigeria around is to endanger its own existence. They should elect to build systems of governance that favor society over personal gain. This is more so as a, as a result of ever increasing and high vertical inequalities and horizontal inequalities as poverty has led to increased criminalities and conflicts that may seem the non limits to our society as, as we know it today, if we do not do the need for now. Today, no one expects, no one especially those uh, perceived to belong to the elected middle class or power elite can move freely in many parts of the nation and daily, as we are hearing, I mean, words of uh, ungoverned spaces, in quote, within our nation. Now, as I'm trying to round up, strong connecting link between the ruling class and the public. That there should be a very strong connecting link between the ruling class, who are the policymakers and the mass public. If this is done, it will reduce the tendency of imposed policies from the top. An enabling environment should be created where policy making should be participatory. Public awareness should be created. The civil society, the civil society groups, professional bodies, organized private sector, and the mass public should be given the opportunity to present their proposals for public, uh, for public, uh, public policy making and implementation, thereby connecting the nexus between the government and other professional bodies. For example, what, I mean, just yesterday I, was, I, I read in the, the, the media about um, the government uh, trying to, uh, I think there's a new law or a, or, or a policy where Uber and um, all these uh, privates that uh, you pay five uh, million uh, annually and that you will not, uh, you won't allow any vehicle that is more than, uh, than uh, less than three years to be used. I mean, use, I mean who in this economy can afford to use a three-year-old car? It's like you are buying a brand new car. So these are the issues which we need also to engage with the government at this time. This policy, I mean, it's a uh, Finally, I can't end this presentation without emphasizing the need for, for catalysts of change to be immune to the pillory and exploration of political party jobbers, party demagogues, who always perceive any altruistic interventionist move, move to change certain governmental policies as being actuated by political moves. Some people are labeled sympathizers of opposition parties. These rabid fundamentalist political jobbers who have littered the social media always in such criticism for the prison of political partisanship. I've had my own fair share of such attacks, but I'm on part of A fellow compatriot, Adiola Shweton, has a shooting guard to dress them up when he recently wrote, and I quote, BFC, baby wars and COVID-19. 
Binary fixation complex, that BFC, is a psychosis in which the sufferers perceive every issue and criticism in the narrow view that the critic for national development is either a PDP or APC member or sympathizer. BFC is, a, is mainly self-inflicted. It may be self-limiting depending on the intensity and can be contagious momentarily. But unlike COVID-19, it does not kill its patients. But it has a long-time debilitating effect on the central nervous system of the sufferers, which can make them permanently suffer from cognitive distortion. My painstaking research so far on this epidemic of thoughts and cognitive dissonance in a much contaminated social economic environment seems to suggest that binary fixation complex may be an opportunistic secondary infection in secret and other reasoning disease, suffered mostly by the Abobakus. The, the Congress or otherwise of this thought system will be fully analyzed as part of the postmortem on the nation and many of is living deaths in my forthcoming watch requested anthology of an interventionist next year. The title, hold your breath to them, but please don't fix, unquote. Thank you. Let me also use the opportunity to uh, appreciate the presence of the NBA president elect uh, and also. Uh, congratulate the con um, organizer of this program, <coughs> the uh, Mimba, and uh, particularly the chairman of Ramimba, uh, Mr. Adeshino Ogunlana. Uh, I want to congratulate them, uh, not just for doing uh, a one year. Uh, 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 and the first year of the struggle, of a po very popular struggle, but also because it was a struggle that showed that the middle class professional in a e social and economic space like ours could play a very transformative role. So and I think that lesson is very, very important. I want to appreciate uh, distinguished uh, uh, personalities who uh, also have been gracious to be here today. I've been asked to uh, discuss through the paper ably presented by uh, Mr. Richard Akron Nola um, with the focus on um, the role of the enlightened middle class in the struggle for a proper Nigeria. Using the Lagos State Anti Land Use Charge 28, Mr. Akinola, I know his pedigree. Uh, I happen to have met uh, Mr. Akinola actually on the barricades, literally on the barricades in 1989, when as a student we led the protest against the structural adjustment program of uh, the then Babangida administration. Uh, it was always a court, this time we had a court appearance. He always took time to um, encourage the two of us who were in court to actually challenge the legal detention. And of course, thanks to the support of his likes and the media at that time, and the intense struggles in the campuses and the larger Nigerian society, we ended up being the first um, winner. I don't know how you put it in legal terms. <laughs> of a suit of that degree too. Because then, uh, anybody arrested on that degree too, you couldn't go to court, but it had an obstacle clause, which says that the degree two could not be challenged. So all the SS lawyer had to do was just to waive the clause. You can't challenge this decree, sorry. And of course, the revenge, Chief Ganyra Fawe himself, was under detention, even while our own case was going on. Um, so we ended up being the first Nigerians to win that case because the then uh, uh, presiding judge, uh, she now ruled that uh, he had a right as a court to hear that suit. And, uh, and I will go ahead to hear it. And uh, it was 
going to deliver a judgment which was that the detention was illegal, null and void, and that we should be set free. So that was also uh, a primal landmark that even under military dictatorship, mm -hmm. draconian and tyrannical laws could be successfully challenged. How much less under a so called democracy? Which brings me to the um, topic in focus, the role of the middle class, which uh, Mr. Ismola has uh, ably, uh, <coughs> extensively dealt to it. I noticed that in his presentation, he gave a lot of focus to the importance of policy and the role of uh, the middle class professional in actually helping with policy formulation and, so, and their successful implementation towards uh, the general development and progress of society. Um, he actually argues quite forcefully that uh, the middle class uh, has that fundamental role to play in charting direction of society, uh, not only in respect of the cultural, social, and economic life of the society, but also the general well-being of the general populace. I completely agree uh, with that position. Uh, I will only go a little bit further to argue that policy development in itself, as our own history has shown, uh, does not only derive relevance and credibility by the fact that enlightened people are involved in their formulation process of formulating them. They also derive potency from the spectrum, the ideological spectrum from which the formula, uh, policy formulation process uh, is situated. Our history has shows that in the era of national planning, when we used, when we used to have uh, not just enlightening the middle class, but of course also committed progressive professionals uh, involved in the project of national plan. Uh, our country actually witnessed relatively uh, uh, good development. I mean, in terms, at least in terms of basic deliverables, talking of good roads, portable water, electricity. Uh, provision and so on and so forth. So much so that when you closely look at what was achieved, even under the soldiers, under the military, you, you, and you now want to compare with the 20 years, 1999 to now, you want to, you want, you begin to want to ask what exactly has happened to us. I know, for instance, that most of the uh, road network that the the, the uh, present government, uh, successive governments in 1999 have found impossible to fix, you know, were actually constructed between 70 and 75 after the Civil War. Lagos, Ibadan, up to Kaduna, Lagos, Ibadan, Oyo, Shogo, like that, you know, all over. The built refineries, right, the national shipping line with 42 ships, you know, you had the Nigerian Airways, which was actually awarded the best Airways at the point, I think, in 1973, you had the Kenji Dam built. You had a lot of uh, 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 um, remote part of this country for the first time lighted with electricity, you know, in those periods. And those are the soldiers, you know. So you want to now look at what's happening now. And of course, we have to acknowledge we have to acknowledge the uh, also very highly spirited and very determined developmental stride uh, by a very progressive party, uh, the Action Group, and then the UPN. And in fact, you, I sometimes we discuss development, and you raise the issue about the fact that the state especially in the developing economy, has a fundamental role to play, to set the place, to engage its enlightened citizenship in the development process 
to canalize human resources, human capital for development, the state has a primary role. You know, I usually use the Japan Day government as a point of reference. And now we have COVID-19. There was a lockdown of almost two months. And we were expecting that this is an opportunity. We use this period of lockdown to at least bridge a few gaps in the terrible state of public services, you know, especially healthcare and education. We thought that during the lockdown, more classrooms will be built so that the 100, 120, 200 class, uh, I mean, children per class schools will be decongested. More teachers who are otherwise unemployed anyway will be engaged. And that period will be used to revamp the hospitals, equip them, and so on and so forth. And that the elite will even have some common sense to even put some few uh, good, really good hospitals so that they don't have to travel out all the time. By the way, they said that they have spent a million dollars, you know, uh, every month. That means 12 billion US dollars per annum on um, um, medical tourism. Um, so we were, we were thinking that at least they will use a fraction of these monies, whether by publicly, sold privately, however, to develop some of these things, bridge some of these gaps, revamp some of these, and make life really a little bit more, you know, livable for most Nigerians. But it didn't happen. Uh, we only came to know a few months, I mean, after the so-called lockdown eased, that actually they were busy sharing money. Why? Most Nigerians were actually starving, you know, under the so-called lockdown. Um, I mean, I'm sure we're all familiar with the 21 billion, billion naira NDDC fund that was shared uh, within a few months, mainly under the lockdown. And of course, they justified that they used the money to give themselves by the <laughs> <laughs> So, you take that and the other point of departure of what a government mobilizing, progressive, enlightened middle class will achieve free education uh, was declared. First of all, they had to cancel shift system in the schools and they had to they built close to 100 new, uh, uh, new classroom blocks between the period of October 1979 and January 1980. So that they face out the shift system in Lagos, they, 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 they brought teachers from all over the world I happened to be in lower secondary school at that time, and I remember most of my teachers were either Ghanaians or Indians, and so on. They supply free test books, and they still had sufficient funds to build roads, to fix, uh, as a matter of our lawsuits, uh, emerged from that era. Um, uh, they opened up the rural areas of Lagos, you know, they invested in transportation, they had the LSTC buses, the Lagos State Transport Corporation, which was very well run in, the, in, in those period of four years, you know, they touched agriculture, they, they, op they opened up the waterways and pioneered water transportation for the first time in the history of this country. They were about investing in metro line. And I tell people, I haven't mentioned the housing estates, you know, 14 housing estates, you know, one of them, the largest reputed to be the largest in Africa. All of that happened in four years. It was done by Nigerians. It was not, um, we didn't import Chinese to help us fix it. And we're talking about almost 40 years ago. You know? So the issue is what went wrong? Uh, what, what are we doing wrong? That we are not even, in 20 years, you can't even point to 5% of what was, of the quantum of achievement. Uh, that was uh, made in four years under a progressive government that was able to canalize the human resources available to actually achieve development. So uh, my, I, I, I want to take this point for the policy to say that there must be that ideological anchor for policy to have meaning. And in a developing economy, the least uh, uh, ideological focus you can have to achieve the development. It's social democracy. I don't want to go into the isms, you know, but the least 
history itself has abundantly made that very clear. Is social democracy, what you can have is social democracy that actually has society and people and human beings as focus of development rather than profit and accumulation of profit and which only encourage greed and the kind of uh, cannibalistic system we are having now. Uh, you know, uh, experience also that that doesn't work. So, for the role, for me, the role of the enlightened, I, want, I would like to, because you can be enlightened, really, and actually use your position of enlightenment and knowledge to simply, you know, profiteer and help yourself and your family. I, I, I want to replace with due permission the word enlightened with progressive. I'm sorry, and I don't mean uh, APC, please. Uh, you know, because so many concepts come to our shores and they become bastardized. The word progressive is one of those uh, uh, concepts that has become. So when you say progressive, people get confused. What are you talking about? Is it the APC we put again? <laughs> and of course, they know what APC means. And I'm saying that without any fear of contradiction. Their rule has meant under development, their rule has meant growing unemployment for Nigerian youth. Their rule has meant homelessness, the whimsical evictions of the poor and working poor from their homes and workplaces. Their rule has meant regression, actually. When you look at all the indices of development, there is really nothing that we can actually attribute as development in the past 20 years under these people. And, and I think we have to make that point very sharply clear. And that and that happened because the progressive middle class has been unorganized or rather has been disarticulated. They were first of all disartic disarticulated ideologically. The, the large chunk of the middle the progressive middle class, people who were in university together, we left university together and we came out with a lot of dreams. A lot of them are working with these people because some of them are de quite genuinely why a, a huge chunk of that can be attributed to share opportunism and careerism. A huge chunk of them also genuinely felt at some point that these people actually meant well. We should work with them. Maybe we could get some things fixed. But we have shown that these guys don't mean nowhere for nobody. They only mean well for their pockets. And if you get there, if you get down there with them, you're going to be sucked into the vortex of corruption, underdevelopment, and mass misery, which is what their governance has meant for all of us in the past 20 years. What we, the confusion was that we bought into the idea that yes, we can, the only way we can achieve development is to privatize everything. The only way we can achieve development is to do everything to commission consultants. So, so you, you see a governor who resumes office 8 a.m. and the evening is only a way talk with consultants. <clears throat> Check it out. Very close to them. Check it out. All the all the active working is there with consultants. They are cutting deals. They are made, it is never about how can we fix the schools? How can we make the hospitals work? How can we get more? Uh, engage more doctors, and how we do it for that, uh, provide more potable water, and so on and so forth. It's never about that. And that paradigm never works. That paradigm has only meant crisis. And that is where uh, the Mr. Ogulanon led the uh, NBA, he said a branch struggle against the land use charge became of uh, particular importance because first of all in my own lived memory that was the first time I see lawyers actually coming out to protest anything. Of course we've had a lot of lawyers, progressive minded lawyers who have uh, supported the civil rights movement in the past, the anti-military struggles in the past, some of them even led those movements, you know, but for them to actually be the first, uh, uh, the, the, the first point of call, you know, in that in that kind of struggle, uh, that was a first. 
and the fact that that struggle was won, you know, it's not just heartwarming, it's also a reassurance that indeed, if it's struggle, we may win. But when we refuse to do anything in the face of tyranny, oppression, and grand corruption, then we have lost everything. So the, the, the rallying call, really, is for us to see what happened 2018 as, uh, uh, and uh, uh, very recently, even parents, you know, also uh, uh, prove the efficacy of the fact that when you struggle, you win. You know, sometimes you may not win 100%, you may not win everything you ask for. But honestly, I'm not a part of any struggle that you don't win something. It doesn't happen, even under the soldiers. When we did the anti military, the anti star protest, of course, they didn't scrap star, but they reviewed it. And they came up with what they call 22 star relief measures. Part of it was that they were going to employ 56,000 graduates. I'm sure Ms. Agnola will remember that period. You know, bursary to university students and so on and so forth. Those were some of the immediate fallout of that particular struggle. There is never an honest, popular struggle that you lose. You may not win everything, you may not win a complete policy reversal, but you will win something. And when there is a sharp ideological focus for a mass struggle, definitely you're going to win a fundamental paradigm shift with consistency and focus. Once again, I want to thank the organizers and also thank you. They are to struggle, they are to win. And also, to be compelled to speak. Well, <laughs> we have to kill that composer. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the truth is, there's a huge connection between law and development. There is a huge connection between public interest advocacy and the role of lawyers. Something significant happened during the lockdown. I realized that lawyers were exempted from the group of essential service providers. And I told my wife, I said, we are diminished in the committee of stakeholders that define either the promotion of the rule of law or development. And the truth is very, very clear. What made us essential service providers is the promotion of the rule of law and the defense of human rights. So we are now selling lands and we're doing businesses and we're doing so many other things. And when it was time for government to determine who should be on the road at the height of a lockdown, they didn't consider it right. So it took the spirited effort of some of us to start drafting court processes for us to be enlisted as essential service providers. I think that's a major disconnection. What makes us lawyers is public interest is the advocacy and promotion of the rule of law, is defense of justice. And when that connection is not there, we are like bankers. We are no longer essential service providers. We must return to that. And when the president made assurances that the bar must be strengthened so that our public voice could be heard, I think that is the relationship we need. I was the pioneer secretary of section on public interest and development law, SPIDERS, which actually um, the president elected, Mr. Mark has come, let us go to this place. The truth is, there are just so many policies, interventions that the bar could do. They're just, be it electoral, be it development, even financial services. We have a situation where the global standard index for loans is being introduced. While it looks that it will cure 
the challenges of non-performing loans. But what about the human rights issues that are privacy and all that? Who is looking at that? So I think, in line with Mr. President's position, President-elect, we must renew the connection between law and development. And that link is in policy formulation and governance. Thank you so much.